somewhat familiar with promotional games and advert games, aren't we? There's certainly a few pretty famous ones kicking around for big brands. All the McDonald's related games, for example, or Cool Spot. Amiga platforms like Zool, James Pond 2 and Super Fog that so happen to respectively advertise Chupa Chups, Penguin Bars and LucasAid. There's even some very silly old ones that are pretty well known, like Chase the Chuck Wagon for the Atari 2600, a game made by Purina to advertise dog food and Pepsi Invaders Coke Wins for the same platform, a game distributed internally at Coca-Cola HQ as some sort of rah-rah piece. These sorts of games have always interested me as an aficionado of the classic licensed game. But as it turns out, well, there's a lot more ones out there than just what the people know. For this video centred around promotional and advert games, I'm taking the roads less travelled. We're ignoring consoles completely and looking at old computers. In doing so, we find a lot of interesting things. We've got games for brands you might not expect to see featuring such things at all, more games that were purely designed to be distributed inside of companies and never reached a commercial shelf, games with a very strong political and civic message, and even a game that advertises cigarettes. And shockingly, not all of these obscurities are terrible. Most are, but a couple of these are decent. So, get a load of these games that you may well not know. Perhaps we should start with the cigarette game first. Now you might wonder if I'm pulling some sort of bait and switch here. This could just be some sports game that takes the name of a world championship tournament for example, back in the days when cigarette branding was all over sports. But no, this isn't Rothman's football quiz on the spectrum. This is a game where cigs are front and centre, live and in your face, and of all genres, it's a point and click adventure game. One that a big company was involved with. I Give You, Sunny Shine on the Funny Side of Life, released commercially in 1990 for the Atari ST, Amiga and C64 in Germany only. The plot has you play as a 30-something ad exec named Sunny Shine who, whilst buying a pack of his favoured l and M cigarettes, for they were the ones who commissioned this thing, had his car accidentally steamrolled. It's your job to find another car for our chain-smoking friend, or whilst talking to various other people who may well help you. I suppose that is if you give them a cigarette or a light or whatever. Most everyone in this game smokes and you can find some sort of advertisement from l and in just about every screen of the game. To be honest I can't say too much about it seeing as it's all in German, but most people say that this whole thing comes off as a poor man's LucasArts game, similar most of all to Zack McCracken. Quite a surprising amount of effort went into the thing and it was actually available to buy on shop shelves but no it's not very good. It is weird though, especially in 2020, to think that once ago there was a game that, like this that advertised cigarettes. It's baffling. And to think that so much effort went into it. Rainbow Arts were the folks who apparently developed this thing. But Sunny Shine wasn't the only game advertising cancer sticks out there. Others were created, although most of them were only distributed internally and unfortunately they're still missing in action. We know of a game called Come Together, which was commissioned by Peter Stuyvesant, the Light American Space Game for Philip Morris, and R1R2 for Rintzma. All three of these were made by Ego Software, who you may remember from the last video about Amiga Euro platformers as creators of Ugh and later makers of the X Space Games. Their founder, Bernd Lehan, said that back then he didn't think too much about creating these ad games or who they were for. It was just a living, pretty much. Just a job to do. Eh, hey ho. So as we all know, if you smoke too many cigarettes, well, you may get sick. And you may end up needing some pharmaceuticals. Well, not to worry. Glaxo Wellcom have got you covered. They've got you covered so much, in fact, that in 1992, they had a game made featuring a hero by the name of George Glaxo. Well, I guess he's a hero anyway. Much like Captain Novelin, he is a hero stricken by a health condition, in his case, asthma. 
George makes his way through various levels, and he has to take the correct medicine in order to stop himself from getting short of breath. However, various animals will try and thwart his progress. Some can actually hurt poor George, but others just indirectly hurt him by causing him to get asthmatic. Like this cute fluffy dog right here. He's gorgeous, but he's also a hazard. Maybe you can avoid him. Eh, well, sometimes. But other times, well, you just got no choice other than to shoot him to death. Yes, this promotional game, made for big pharmaceutical company Glaxo, features you shooting cute puppies and other animals minding their own business to death, simply because they give you asthma. Some hero, huh? I mean, I'm sure that this sadistic boy here isn't representative of all asthmatics, but that's one freaky message, isn't it? This is kind of where we're at with these strange games. So, seeing as how we're trying to awkwardly link these games together, I'll say that if, like George Glaxo, you go around shooting cute animals to death, you may well fall foul of outfits like Greenpeace. And yes, Greenpeace had a game that was commercially released during the time when they seemed to be making a fair bit more publicity for themselves. Presenting to you Rainbow Warrior, published by MicroStyle in 1989, and even named after their flagship that was bombed on route to a nuclear protest a few years prior to this. Now I can already see the comments making politically laced jokes. Ha ha, they say. This must be Greta Thunberg's favourite game. Ha <laughs> ha. Now I'm not necessarily above making such jokes, but I would say instead that if Greta so happened to play this game, it may well be the reason why she always seems to have such a sour expression. Why? <laughs> well, because it's atrocious. It's the worst environmental centric game I have ever played. And yeah, that makes it worse than Awesome Possum. Rainbow Warrior consists of several dreadfully made and often unintentionally hilarious minigames, the majority of which are basically unplayable. I really have no idea what's going on in the section where you play as a dolphin and have to block pipes, nor did I know that Greenpeace had dolphins actively working for them. You have other things like boarding a waste ship that's dumping crap in the water and manning their cranes, which again just looks quite amusing, it looks like you get on top and you're just like, yeah, it's like you're having a rave or whatever. Perhaps the silliest ones involve trying to shoot down flying aerosol cans that are spraying holes in the ozone layer, or the platform level where you have to save seals from being clubbed. Aside from it being uncontrollable, the sight of these enemies frantically running around and just whacking seals is... I, I can't lie, it's hilarious. I guess not least because for me, and I presume others of a certain age, the idea of baby seals being clubbed is inextricably linked to the television antics of Tom Green. You know, MC face, slaughter your water, all of that. Anyway, yeah, this game is bloody awful. There's nothing whatsoever to do with the environmental message, of course, it's just unplayable, ridiculously utter crap. There is another game of the handful I've chosen to highlight that's also nothing but mini games. It's not as bad, but it is quite funny. Now, you may have thought that advertising games wouldn't get much weirder than the Japanese only PS1 title Pepsi Man, mind you. Well, that's where you're on. In fact, that's far from the only title out there that's filled with Pepsi branding. Why, here's Pepsi all over the world. This is another promotional game only for the Amiga from 1991, it's by Ego Software again, and it's also German. Most of these games are German as it happens. This simple affair gives you a few brief mini-games. Two of them, one where you collect drips of oil in Alaska, and another where you try to stop cups of tea from falling in Japan, are basically the same. In Australia, you control a kangaroo as he tries to avoid obstacles en route to a Pepsi sign, and in Ireland, you do some fishing before relaxing with a nice cool drink on the riverbank. The funniest minigame lies in Egypt. You have to guide your man here across the lake in a frogger style jumping on top of crocodiles and all of that, in order to reach the conveniently placed Pepsi vending machine that's on the other side. <laughs> it's all rather slight and, yeah, stupid. There is actually a much stronger game chock full of Pepsi branding. Well, a little bit of branding anyhow. 1988 saw the release of Mad Mix Pepsi Challenge for the C64 and other platforms by US Gold. And it's actually quite good. It is fairly derivative, essentially it's a Pac-Man type game but with a few little added features like conveyor belts and different power-ups. There isn't too much relation to Pepsi aside from the logo, but the game itself isn't bad. US Gold did this sort of thing more than once. If you think back to a couple of videos ago and that terrible Amiga port of Thunderblade, remember that it had Pepsi advertising all over it? 
You even took off on a Pepsi sponsored helipad. Anywho, Mad Mix is an ok enough commercial title with a bit of advertising tacked onto it. It was a bit of a borderline case for inclusion here, but I thought it worth sticking in. Here's another half decent game that's also chock full of branding, even more so than Mad Mix. This is Tony and Friends in Kellogg's Land, released in Germany only for the Amiga and created by no lesser studio than the almighty Factor 5. You take control of Tony the Tiger in the main, but you can also on occasion switch to his mates who have different abilities. You've got Coco the Monkey, Toucan Sam, and even Diggum Frog. You know, the frog that advertises smacks. The end result is, as you might expect, a rather typical European platformer, but that alone makes it better than most everything else you see here. Cause let's face it, aside from the odd shocking gem like One Step Beyond, a lot of these advert games and promotional games just aren't all that good. I mean, just look at Sony game for example. Here you play as some ridiculous looking Walkman mascot come to life and you have to find pictures of various Sony products in a stupidly short time limit and the whole thing is a flick screen affair that looks like it was knocked up in about 5 minutes. I suppose at the very least this wasn't commercially released, Tony and Friends was worthy of being stuck on shelves. But can you imagine some bizarro world where this crappy promotional game right here is Sony's only contribution to the world of video games? How strange would that be? Ok, we have a couple more, we're going to finish with some rather odd dealios for the spectrum. Why not have a quick dip into the world of fast food? Now of course there's plenty of McDonald's games, we all know that they're not worth covering. Those cheapo Burger King games on the Xbox 360, well, they're not really worth it either. However there was surprisingly a Burger King game on the spectrum. Here's Whopper Chase, released in 1987. Oddly enough it only came out in Spain. Anyway, you play as a Whopper, shock of horrors. You have an utterly terrible job. You are a sentient Whopper who can make your way to the patron so that you can be eaten alive. However, before you reach him you must collect the four different parts of the Burger King logo. This is so the customer knows that what he has ordered is a legitimate Whopper flame grilled to delicious perfection. For some reason there's other chefs, presumably from other fast food companies, and other sentient foodstuffs who want to stop you from being eaten and killed by these customers that you're going to have to avoid. It's all pretty crap as you can see, but my lord it's also very weird. We've got McDonald's, we've got Burger King, and guess what? We also have a game representing the UK's champion, the old burger house that makes people bristle with nostalgia. Wimpy. Here's Mr Wimpy, a game by Ocean Software from 1984. Once I had visions of getting a copy of this game and making a video where I actually reviewed this game at a Wimpy, seeing as most of the few Wimpies that are still around are actually right here in Essex. I still have multiple locations within walking distance. However, doing such a thing is currently impossible and wimpy as crap anyway, so nah, this'll do. The game itself is quite basic indeed. It starts off with a simple game where you have to get ingredients from one side to the other and take them back home, and after that it becomes a burger time clone. Much like Wimpy itself, it's aggressively mediocre at best. You might play this and hope to relive some childhood nostalgia, just as you would eat the burgers every once in a while or, I don't know, get a brown derby, but in the end you're most likely going to be rather disappointed. We move from one 1980s British icon, almost seamlessly, to another. Shakin Stevens. We all know and love Shaky, don't we? He strutted around like a man whose claim to fame was winning a Best Elvis impersonator competition at a Bognorigis Butlins in 1974, but an error in the TV schedule saw him become a star by mistake. Although it has to be said, for all his crapness there is something quite endearing about good old Shaky. Anywho, Shaky was even the star of a game that was quite simply called The Shaky Game. It's a very simple game indeed. You've got a single maze, you have to avoid bugs and find your way to the centre, to Shaky's old house. Whether you win or lose, you'll get this picture of Shaking Stevens and his signature. Haha, <laughs> great eh? I mean I'm sure you all want to play this game right now. You may be shocked that something like this was ever on the shelves, but this is something a bit different. You could only find this game at the end of the cassette version of Shaky's 1983 album, The Bop Won't Stop meaning this was actually a unique little mix of medias back in the day, even if the game's obviously terrible. 
In fact, here's the man himself at the end of that album introducing the game. Hi, this is Shaky. If you've got a Sinclair Spectrum 48K computer, why don't you try my game? The program follows shortly. If you haven't, please fast forward to the end of the tape so that you can listen to the album again. It's late. <laughs> I mean, you can tell he's very clued up on all of this newfangled technology by the way he says 48K Spectrum, can't you? Jeez. I mean, that's almost as bad as saying Nintendo NES. Lastly, well, this game may not necessarily be promoting a brand or anything like that, but it's certainly promoting something we were all told to do in the 80s. We were told to just say no. While you may be familiar with other anti-drug efforts from games back then, from the winners don't use drugs splash screens to the rather depressing pusher related death in the Grange Hill game, you won't find an anti-drugs message quite as stark and as harrowing as the one in Drug Watch, a game created for the Nottinghamshire Constabulary as a way of getting the message across to the kids with their computers to not do drugs, take coke, take pills, sniff glue and all of that. You're a young boy trying to make your way in the world, but in order to get anywhere, you have to avoid the pusher. What do these pushers do? Well, going by this game, they form an orderly line and march in a space invader-like formation towards you while constantly throwing pills, needles and the word drug in your direction. But you can respond by throwing the word no right back at them, at which point they'll stop. If you do this for a few levels, you'll be congratulated for saying no. If you fail and your assistance drops down to zero, well guess what? You die! You die! You die! Ah. Now I cannot do that as well as John Robertson can, but I imagine I could probably make a better game than this one. It is quite a hilarious piece of anti-drug nostalgia, to the point where you wonder if it's some sort of parody. Was this created by Chris Morris perhaps, as some sort of obscure promotion for the drugs episode of Brass Eye? That would be the sort of thing he'd do. But no, this game was real. It's even got cover art and everything. It might just be the weirdest piece of specky software I've ever encountered and believe me, I've seen plenty. I think that for now, I can't top Drug Watch, so it's time to end the video. There are certainly many more promotional games out there. I'm sure a few of you are clamouring for some analysis of the likes of, I don't know, Mr. Pip for DOS, or a whole raft of games that appear to have been commissioned by German government departments, or various other strange obscurities that are still yet to be discovered. Because as is often the case, the likes of Pepsi Man or Sneak Kin or even Coke Wins, while quite strange, are not but the tip of the iceberg. So join us next time, when no doubt we'll have more weird tidbits from the world of computers to look at. But until then, as ever, bye for now. Thanks so much for watching this video on the weird world of promotional games. I hope that all of you are keeping very safe indeed during this time well, as safe as you can. Just remember everyone, stay smart, don't venture into the outside world. <laughs> anyway, if you like this video then, please do like it, please uh, do put in some useful comments, have a look at my social media, particularly my Twitter, I shitpost on there all the time, and also have a look at my Patreon, especially if you're into some exclusive stuff like, say, wrestling documentaries. You could also join this list of awesome people right here. Alexa Jones Gonzalez, Andrew Dalton, Andy Capt, Arcade LY Webmaster, Asobi Quan DX, Brian Henniger, Chris, Conrad Pritchard, D Xalior Rimwon Sutter, Dagoraf Dungeon Keeper, Dave Cork, David Rose, Dustin Cooper, Gary Samaden, Jordi Alex, Glunafeth, Jayas Manchild, James Brown, Jace Alexander, Jeff Ladd, Lucas Kligovsky, Matthias Gramzov, Mike Clayton Travis, Martin Pataki, Nate Middlebank, Potter Margell, Renbimon, Rusty Kelly, Seth Robinson, Simon Gulliver, Stuart Christopher Brownlee, Tariq Amir, Tim Wald, Yurka Operator, thank you all of you all so much, and to all the rest of the community, I love you, and goodbye.